Dr. Fishbein? Yes. It's now a good time to throw in a question. Uh, uh, sure, we've got a couple minutes till we start and you can just call me Don. Okay. Uh, has there been research done and are there practical applications for using the difference between the highs and lows during the middle of a day versus the typical ending price for the day. Uh, that, that difference, has there been analysis to see that that difference is predictable or is it purely as random as the stock market itself, the difference between you know start of the day, end of the day, randomness? Yeah, there, there's a fellow named uh, Art Collins who was a, a technical analyst, kind of an old school technical analyst um, who's uh, written extensively about that. Um, I believe his website is just artcollins.com. Um, and he has uh, numerous systems that uh, work off of the um, uh, where the closing price falls in relation to the high and the low of the day. So you might check out some of his work. His systems tend to be, um, they have a profit factor greater than one, but a win-loss ratio that's pretty close to 50%. So for many, for many people, they're uncomfortable to trade, but, but they in fact do make money since the profit factor is, uh, you know, his wins are bigger than his losses basically. But, um, He's an, he's an old school, no nonsense guy and where most people, uh, <laughs> including myself, take uh, you know, 30 to 45 minutes to describe their system. I like that his YouTube videos are always under five minutes. So you might, you might check him out with regards to that. Is it uh, time to get started, uh, Samantha? Yep, um, I could just introduce this real quick and you can get started. Um, hello everyone, this is the second session of the T8 block. Um, this presentation is on start stock market predictions using neural networks, um, and you can start if you like. All right. Um, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, my first uh, uh, Zoom presentation, I participated in a lot of Zoom meetings, but uh, this is the first time as a presenter. So what we're going to talk about is um, mostly money. Um, if you're looking for an in-depth analysis of the mathematics behind neural networks, uh, this, this isn't that talk. Uh, uh, this, this picture just, uh, just made me laugh. It's kind of a mashup of uh, Tom Cruise and the J.D. Wentworth commercial and an angry little guy. Um, so I've been coming to TCF for a while. That's a, a second from the left is me. Third from the left is uh, Don Liebes. Uh, I grew up in New Jersey within walking distance of the uh, Liebus' home. Um, I live outside of Denver, Colorado now. Uh, uh, quite, um, uh, quite the stir recently when Men's Health Magazine ranked Denver, Colorado as only the second booziest city in the country. Uh, uh, Denverites, as you see in this picture, got to work immediately to uh, try to right that wrong. Um, I did read that uh, while general sales tax revenue has fallen 15 to 20% in Denver, alcohol sales tax revenue is up almost 50%. So it's nice to see that that stimulus money isn't being wasted on uh, uh, um, trivial things like food and rent. Um, this is usually the point at financial talks where there's some sort of a disclaimer, uh, you know, the past results don't predict future performance. This is for educational use only, et cetera, et cetera. I like this XKCD cartoon. And it's, it's just kind of a warning that um, I, I know a few of you out in the audience, but uh, I don't know most of you, you don't know me. Uh, for all you know, I'm not even Don Fishbein. Um, you should take everything, everything you hear with a grain of salt. And I've been listening to financial presentations uh, since uh, back in the day where you would send a couple bucks to, a, to an address and get a, a cassette and some Xerox pages in return. Um, and I've heard a lot of nonsense um, over the years, but I've heard some good points uh, too. So uh, it's, it's up to you to determine uh, the validity of what you hear. Um, this is an email I got recently, um, not, not an email, a, a, a physical mailing. 
uh, claiming uh, this, this uh, uh, Ms. Kirkland here claimed uh, that she was able to double your money 41 times in eight months. Now, I'll just point out, I can't see it at the top of my screen, but uh, two raised to the 41st power is about two trillion. Uh, so that doesn't seem like a reasonable claim to me. I mean, if you started with a buck, you could uh, you could have paid for the recent stimulus bill and uh, and uh, had some money left over. Um, you have to take things with a grain of salt. Uh, these are my objectives today. Uh, very simple. One to show you that uh, stocks and their derivatives are the place to be for long-term capital growth, that the market can be timed, that the easiest way for the little guy, and uh, I assume we're all little guys, is to use technical analysis and not fundamental analysis, and that you can make small incremental improvements to good systems using neural networks and genetic algorithms. Um, this, is, this is one of the most informative graphs I've ever seen. It's in a book called Stocks for the Long Term or something of that sort by Dr. Jeremy Siegel, who's a, an economist at Penn. Um, this graph is a little old, but in, in, in fact, the, the, um, the differences uh, in, in, since uh, December 2013 have even grown greater. Um, the, the stock market is clearly the place to be. Um, and uh, stocks have vastly outperformed bonds, uh, T-bills, gold, and really done a lot better than the dollar, which has is, which is, um, lost almost all of its value in the past 200 years. The other thing to note from this graph, now in the past 10 years or so, the real performance of stocks has been over 10%. So the, the, this, this top line um, would be even steeper. But the thing to notice, uh, or the thing to note, and I'm, uh, most people know this, but very small differences in annual return over long periods of time can turn into very large differences in, in total return. Um, so this is great. You might look at this and say, I'll just put my money in stocks and, um, and be done with it. And that's not a bad strategy. This is just a graph showing the small differences in um, annual return can translate uh, due to the miracle of compounding to large differences over long periods of time. Um, this is Dr. Siegel, a uh, very smart man. And, um, but he says, you don't have to be a timer to do well in the market. And he's, he's kind of right, you don't, if you have a very long time frame. Now, if you're, um, if you're my age or, uh, or, or older, um, you do have to be concerned about a few things with the market. Um, people who try to tell you just buy and hold will show you graphs like this um, saying, oh, if you miss um, the 10 best days, the 20 best days, um, how your return will go down. I, I think these are not realistic graphs because your, your, your chance of uh, being able to miss the best days is about equal to your chance of being able to miss the worst days and it would all even out in time. Um, so buy and hold is, is not a bad strategy. In fact, in fact, Fidelity uh, did a study recently and determined that their um, uh, people with the highest return in their accounts were people who were dead, uh, who they hadn't been informed were dead because they didn't trade. A lot of people uh, have no particular plan uh, trading and do a lot worse than buy and hold. The market has dropped more than 50% on seven occasions in the past 88 years, taking an average of nine years to recover. What does that look like? Well, this is, this is a graph from uh, uh, a local person here in uh, uh, Colorado, a, a, a PhD economist who looked at um, what would happen if you invested a dollar for uh, 10 years in the market. And you can see in many cases, your return would be negative. Um, what you want to avoid is being, being swept away by a, a market downturn, especially if your uh, investment horizon is fairly short. Um, this is another graph showing that um, there have been substantial market downturns uh, over the past uh, 130 years, um, and that they can take quite a, bit, quite a bit of time to recover. 
This is an article in uh, Bloomberg Business Week by uh, uh, Jack Bogle, I think he's the, the Vanguard guy, saying that you can't beat the market. And I've got to say, he's just flat out wrong. If you hear something over and over enough times, you start to accept it as dogma. And sometimes you have to step back and say, is that really the truth? Uh, or is the wool being pulled over your eyes? Um, now these guys, um, uh, Fama and French, are from the uh, University of Chicago School of Economics, with you know a, a powerhouse and major proponents of the uh, so-called um, efficient market hypothesis. Uh, this hypothesis says that everything that's known is already incorporated into the market, and that the next move the market makes is completely random. Um, they made an interesting comment here. The premier anomaly is momentum, because in fact, stocks that are doing well tend to keep doing well, and stocks that are not doing well tend to continue to decline. And they call this an anomaly. Well, in science, we say sometimes anomalies are indications that your theory is just flat wrong. Um, but to call momentum an anomaly uh, strikes me as sort of odd. Like if you're a flat earther, like the flat earth people put out this diagram of what the world really looks like, you might consider things like uh, gravity and uh, orbital mechanics to be an anomaly rather than established fact. Um, uh, Einstein was not speaking specifically about the markets, but he said uh, basically that there's nothing uh, as annoying as a counterexample. You can do all the experiments you want to prove something's correct, but one counterexample can um, upset the apple cart, if you will. Um, I have used this example ever since I started talking at TCF, which I think was maybe in the year 2000. And this is an old book on my shelf I bought many years ago. And they talk about a, um, the 4% swing system. The 4% swing system simply says, you wait and when the market goes up 4%, you buy, and the market goes down 4%, you sell, that's it. And obviously it's not a perfect system. If the market were to go up 4%, down 4%, up 4%, down 4%, you'd lose your money 4% at a time, but it works. And um, this was a the system was originally described in the 70s, the 1970s. And looking forward in the 80s, 90s, the uh, aughts and the tens, it has beat the market every, every decade, um, not by much, one, two, three percent, but as we showed previously, small differences over time can add up to uh, tremendous changes. Um, here's another system that's beat the market. This is my own. Um, I have since 2005 uh, either uh, published or emailed by subscription market timing signals. Um, and, and we've uh, uh, done substantially better than the market with lower drawdowns. Um, these are the, the averages over the past 16 years. The, the DIA, which tracks the Dow, 16.8%, the IJR, small cap, 23.8%, with a higher drawdown because of volatility, and the SPY, which tracks the S&P 500, 17.1%. Um, the system did uh, particularly well over the past year during the uh, pandemic. Um, it acted a little oddly rather than the uh, two or three round turn trades that it would generate in a year. It has um, generated only uh, two signals since the start of the, uh, the pandemic. Um, this buy signal, which uh, I'm sorry, this sell signal, which was almost uh, perfectly timed two days after the market decline started. And this buy signal, which um, was a bit late, but nonetheless has, um, uh, Uh, you know, it's predicted a uh, rather dramatic upturn. Um, and since the beginning of uh, 2020, um, the, uh, the signal is called Delta, um, up 43% uh, percent for the cubes, which track the NASDAQ 100. Buy and hold did pretty well during that period, 37% uh, percent up. And the spiders, uh, much more dramatic results, up uh, almost 45%, where buy and hold was up 16%. Um, so 
I hope that I've convinced you the stock market is the place to be. Now, how should we look at the stock market? There's two basic schools of market analysis, fundamental analysis, which looks at the fundamental characteristics of stocks, earnings, uh, growth, debt, things of that sort, and technical analysis, which just looks at the price and volume. Now, fundamental analysis might, at first glance, seem to be the way to go. I mean, shouldn't you look at things like uh, what industry a stock is in and whatever? But, but the problem for, for the little guy, uh, certainly me, is that um, you probably don't have the resources to do really good fundamental analysis. Do you want to go head to head with one of uh, Warren Buffett's uh, analysts about railroads and decide which is the best railroad to own? Uh, do you even have access to the same information that uh, Warren Buffett or that a Goldman Sachs analyst has? On the other hand, technical analysis is just based on price and volume. You've got exactly the same information that, um, that anyone does. Um, of course, some forms of analysis don't really fall into any category. Um, I actually sat next to this guy um, at a financial conference, and uh, he was telling me that um, at the time he was charging $1,000 a year for subscription to his newsletter and had over uh, 1,000 subscribers, not too shabby, not, not much in the way of results to show. Um, even fundamental analysis uh, with um, easier information, easier access to information may be declining. This is, this is Buffett's margin of outperformance relative to the S&P 500. And over the years, um, he's done less, even had a few years where he underperformed the S&P 500. A oh, brief notice, we had at one hospital I worked at, we had a, a CEO read an article in the Wall Street Journal saying computers weren't being fully utilized in healthcare. We had a very expensive consultant come in who said that everyone needed dual monitors. That was the way to go. That's the reason we weren't productive. And in my, in my lab, you can see the second monitor here was put to good use. Um, can you do this yourself? Uh, you can, this is a fantastic book. Let me go back for a second. It's out of print, but uh, you, can, you can find it on uh, Amazon and eBay. Um, and a, a couple of statements from, from the book, the markets are not random, regardless of the uh, large number of academicians who argue the efficient market hypothesis. Yes, thank you. They are simply wrong. Um, not sure who this guy is. He looks, he looks a little familiar, maybe a governor. I don't know. Um, but the fact is a lot of people don't make their market decisions based on data and science. They're more random. Technical analysis uh, has, has many different subcategories. Two basic categories are chart reading and algorithmic trading. And I'm an algorithmic trader. That's what the Delta system is. Um, charts I find too confusing, too arbitrary. You can decide how these, these trend lines are drawn. It's, you know, ask 10 people to do it, you'll get eight different charts. Um, so I'm not a chart reader per se. Uh, it just presents too much information from, from uh, my opinion. Algorithmic trading has these characteristics. It's non-discretionary, meaning that there's no input from you once you decide on the system to follow. And this is important because a system that is discretionary really can't be back-tested. Um, a system that is completely non-discretionary can be back-tested, and I'll speak a little more of that later. Indicators are basically functions of price and volume. For me, mostly price. Uh, it involves rules. The systems can be optimized. And most importantly, they can be tested. And if, you're, um, if you come from a scientific background and are familiar with the scientific method, you know that um, uh, testing and proving a hypothesis is, is very important. Excuse me for a second. Um, so let's look at one of the simplest technical indicators and see what we can do with this. Um, and that's moving average. What a moving average is simply the average of the last 
n number of bars, a five day moving average, a 10 day moving average. Um, you simply sum up the past five or 10 and, um, uh, and divide by the, the number n. And what this does is tends to give you a, a, a smoothed um, a smooth curve of the price. Now it's, it's technically, I guess it's a, uh, it's a low pass filter. It filters out some of the high frequency noise. The general principle in trading moving averages is that um, when the price is above a moving average and a shorter term moving average is above a longer term moving average, that's a long signal, a signal to be in the market. Um, let's look at an example. Is the bull market dead? I think uh, Joe was asking, or somebody was asking at the beginning of the talk, um, is the bull market dead? And here's a graph. And what we have here are um, very popular moving averages that you hear all the time on CNBC and MSNBC and uh, shows like that, Fox Business. The blue, the the um, candlesticks are the S&P 500 over the past year. And the blue line is a 50 day moving average and the red line, a 200 day moving average. And these are quoted all the time as though they're, they're gospel. Um, and what you can see is that right now, well, for the past nine months, the price has mostly been above the 50-day moving average, and the 50-day moving average has been above the 200-day moving average. So those are those are bullish signals. Um, there's a couple of things you can you can divine from this this graph. One, um, if you've ever heard the, of the death cross or the golden cross mentioned on these analyst shows, that's when the 50-day moving average crosses the 200-day. So right now, here's your death cross and here's your golden cross. One thing we can notice is that these signals are pretty late. Moving averages, because they filter out high frequency components and smooth have lag. And here you can see the death cross, which is the signal to get out of the market, came the, the um, uh, this is the bottom of the pandemic decline back in March. And you can see that when this sell signal comes, it's late. The market's already started to rise. So that would be a losing signal. If you sold short here and bought long here, you would have lost money. Uh, so they're not the greatest signals. And, but nonetheless, analysts talk about them like like uh, they're the gospel. I heard one guy around here, um, well, it would have been back here off of the graph, uh, say, well, since price has fallen below the 200 day moving average, we are now in a secular bear market. For some reason, when you talk about markets, secular means long-term, uh, strange definition. Um, and, and the fact is that that secular bear market lasted eight days. Um, it's, so. Moving averages have some validity, but you can see there's there's lag. And then when the golden cross occurred here and it was time to get back in the market, well, the market had been going up for three months before you got that signal. Um, anyway, there's a difference in the um, the literature of technical analysis and the literature, say, of medicine. Um, if you get a multi-author, you know, eight pound medical textbook, um, when you take the shrink wrap off of it, it's out of date. Um, it's, it's taken one to two years to compile. The references in the book, in the books, uh, don't go back, uh, or, or, or no earlier, no earlier than two or three years in the past. They're out of date, but technical analysis, it's great. You can go back to very old articles pull out a system and see, hey, what's it done for the past 20 years since it was described? Because the danger is always with, with an article that, that it's been curve fit to fit the data. Um, so anyway, this is an article. And if you're interested in technical analysis, the only journal I'd recommend is the technical analysis of stocks and commodities. It's, it's uh, fairly cheap. And the really nice thing is that once you subscribe, you have access to their digital archive, which goes back uh, 20 or uh, over 30 years. I'm not sure when they started publishing. 
So this is an article that I pulled out and I'm gonna speak a little more about this um, uh, now. Um, and what they described was a substitute for the uh, moving average. Um, and they call it the moving trend. And it's very simple. The math is down at the bottom, but very simply what it is, is you take a regression line for some period of time and you take the current, um, the current point on the regression line and then you move forward and you plot those out. And let me go on to the next slide. We can see it a little better here. Um, this is the uh, S&P 500 um, for um, the year 2021. And what we can see are um, the, the prices are plotted in these open and closed bars. And the, the, um, the blue line is, the moving is a five period moving average. And the orange red line is a five period moving trend. And the magenta line is a 10 period moving trend. And what you can see is that the moving trend um, uh, tends to track the price more closely, has less at lag than the moving averages. Here's an example where the moving average is moving, um, is still moving down here and the moving trend has turned up as the price has. So I was thinking, looking at this and saying, gee, what if we took a standard um, uh, technical analysis system, you know, where if price is above moving average, that's a buy. And what if we, instead of the moving average, we put in the moving trend? Would we do any better? Um, so here's an extremely simple system, which I'm going to use for demonstration purposes. Um, I say I'm using it for demonstration purposes. Back when I showed the 4% swing system, now I've used that for 20 years, and a fellow came up to me at a TCF talk. He had been to the one the previous year, and he apparently heard me talk about the 4% swing system, and that's all he heard at the talk, and that's what he thought I was talking about. And that was the system to trade, and he had actually traded it for the past year, and he wanted to show me his, uh, his results. And I was like, no, no, that was just to make a point. Um, anyway, this system is just to make a point, but basically we're going to take a standard moving, uh, moving average system and we're going, to, um, uh, we're going to substitute the moving trend for the moving average and we're going to see, huh, does it do any better? So, oh, this is a sign that always makes me laugh. It's outside the, uh, the north gate of the uh, United States Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. Um, the sign actually makes perfect sense, but it certainly gives you certainly gives you a uh, you know double take. Oh, you know, you can't come in. You're a commercial vehicle, but I've got a bomb in the back. Okay, come right in. Now, in fact, the explosive inspection station is at the north gate. The, the south gate is the commercial entrance. But I always thought this sign was funny. So here's what we did. We took. Um, 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 we use this system trading five minute bars from um, a, a little over a year. And we did no optimization of any kind. We simply use these rules. So the close has to be greater than the moving, the five period moving trend and the five period moving trend greater than the 10 period moving trend. And with no optimization, this system beats the, uh, in both the, S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100, it beats the um, uh, buy and hold by uh, roughly two and a half percent. That's a pretty good result all in itself uh, to beat the market by two and a half percent. A lot of hedge funds don't do that. Um, a lot of uh, advisors don't do that. Um, so that's a pretty good result. And this, this system is extremely simple, you know, no complicated mathematics of any kind. Um, uh, incidentally, if you're, if you're paying a financial advisor, you know, three quarters of a percent or 1% or 2% a year, you might want to look at the, the, back at the compound interest graph and say, gee, you know, do I really want to give up that kind of um, that kind of return over a 30 year period. Anyway, 
So one question to ask is, what time intervals should we trade? And a lot of people are, you know, a lot of people trade daily bars, open and close for the day. Um, this is an outstanding book, um, I think. Uh, I say I think because I read it three times and I really don't understand it uh, by Mandelbrot, the fractal guy um, called The Misbehavior of Markets. And the take home message for me in the book, there's a lot I didn't understand in the book, but the take home message was that markets are fractal. That if I show you this graph, with no labels on the X and Y axis and say, what is this? What period of time am I showing? You have no idea. This could be weekly bars, daily bars, five minute bars. In fact, they're five minute bars, but you can't tell looking at this just on the, on the nature and, and the, the volatility, you can't tell if it's you know, an intraday chart or a daily chart or a weekly chart. That being the case, unless you have a system that relies on specific features of the open and close, like, like the like uh, Art Collins system that I mentioned uh, mentioned earlier um, to uh, Timothy, um, unless you have a system that takes like specific characteristics of how the market opens and the fact that a lot of traders go to lunch between 12 and 2 Eastern time, um, if, if you have a system like this system that doesn't have any of those dependencies, it should work on any time frame because the nature of the market is pretty much the same, whether you're looking at five minute bars or daily bars. Um, so if you can, you might as well trade the shorter term bars because your, your, your return is going to be higher because uh, there's more price variation during that time period. What if we wanted to optimize the system? And here's where we talk a little bit about some of these uh, concepts from artificial intelligence. The first I'll talk about is genetic algorithms. And the thing with genetic, uh, genetic algorithms tend to or, or, uh, try to emulate um, the process of biological evolution. Um, you express the parameters of a system as genes, if you will, and then you employ uh, uh, techniques such as um, gene copying and crossover and extinction um, to help you optimize the system. What it offers over brute force optimization, and brute force optimization, I'm sure everyone's uh, at some point in their life has, has written a program with nested loops to do optimization, you know, for I equals one to N, for J equals one to N, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the problem is that as the number of parameters you're optimizing increases, the time it takes to do brute force optimization rises exponentially. Now, genetic algorithms are a, a shortcut to optimization. This is a three-dimensional graph, um, which the, the um, uh, the error rate is, uh, is the, um, the y-axis here. So the lower down we sink into this bowl, the, the lower our error rate, the more optimized the system is. And genetic algorithms start at multiple random spots, the red being the optimal solution that we're seeking. And, um, uh, and in, in, in less time than brute force optimization takes, arrive at an, an optimal solution or close to an optimal solution. Um, I saw an example where the, the N kings problem is the problem on a chessboard, which is N by N. You need to place N kings so that no king is attacking each other. And this is easy to solve by brute force, but the time it takes is equal to N squared where uh, uh, genetic algorithms can do this in, uh, uh, in time that's more, more related that to uh, linear N. Um, another technique we have are uh, neural networks. And neural networks are ideal if we want to, um, uh, if we want to compute the, the um, relationship between indicators. Now, um, in the rules that I laid out, the indicators were very simple. You know, price is greater than moving trend, um, but maybe that's not the best way to do it. Maybe there's some nonlinear relationship that would not be obvious to us. And um, 
what neural networks excel in are they're able to find these relationships, which are often a nonlinear and non-obvious. Um, uh, if each um, each node at the input level here might be something like price or a moving average of a specific length or uh, other indicators such as RSI or MACD. And the, the knowledge of the, contained in the neural network is contained in the weights between the various nodes. And if we wanna solve a nonlinear problem, we need at least one hidden layer. Now, these are deep neural networks that are rarely used in financial prediction because we have a limited amount of data and we don't want to overfit our data. Um, these are more applicable to things like uh, computer vision. Um, and there's a particular model called uh, feed forward back propagation neural network where the math has been worked out pretty well. And there's a iterative system for determining the, determining the optimal weights. Um, now, one thing we have to be very, very careful. I mean, neural networks first came on the scene in the in the '70s, I believe, and they were seized upon by financial analysts. And the dangers of overfitting were not that well understood, and so they came up with systems that looked great when they were trained on the in-sample data, the data they already had, but when applied to data that the neural network hadn't seen yet, which of course is what you want to do in financial predictions, they failed miserably. And the reason was that the neural network had not learned to generalize. It had simply memorized the inputs and given an input in the, the training set, it could very easily cough up the answer. But when it was shown data that it hadn't seen, um, they did quite poorly. So one way to avoid doing that is called walk forward testing. And what we do um, in this example, we would start here. We would train the network on this data and then let it predict data it hadn't seen yet, week five. And if that worked, we might go on to the next week and now we would train it on weeks two to five and let it predict week six. And we're walking forward doing this and we have, in this case, we have eight uh, tests of out of sample data. And if, our re if we have a good return, and, and these are all data the system hasn't seen yet. And if it does well walking forward, we can say, well, we might have something here. Now there's a step beyond this. I mean, one of the problems we always have with financial data is we don't have enough data. We might have 10, 20 years of a stock, but that's not a lot of sample points. You know, it's not the millions of sample points we'd like to have. There's another system um, uh, I'm not going to speak about in, in any detail called Monte Carlo testing, where we um, generate sample sets that look like the original data, uh, but are not the original data. And then we can test it on thousands of sample sets. Um, this particular system, since I only put this talk together, uh, uh, a few days ago. I haven't had the time to do Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo testing, particularly when neural networks and genetic algorithms are involved, is very time consuming, can take uh, weeks of processing time. Um, so I don't have that here, but realize there is a, a even more rigorous system of testing these. Um, I thought this was hysterical, like uh, I pay, therefore I am, you know, some uh, Descartian philosopher must have made up this sign, uh, or it could have just been a printing error. Um, so how can we use the two together? Um, well, what we can do, uh, neural networks are trained in stages, um, in iterations. We train it and we look for the, the error in predicting the out of sample data to slowly decline in time. What we can do if we have a genetic algorithm available, is with each iteration of the neural network, we can re-optimize the parameters. Genetic algorithms are good for coming up with parameters. And the parameters in the sample I was showing you might be the five and 10 day uh, numbers. 
And those, those, might not, those are just arbitrary numbers. They might not be the best numbers. Uh, there, there might be better numbers to have. Um, so we can iteratively do this, um, do one iteration of the neural network, then re-optimize the parameters, another iteration, so forth and so on. And over time, over many, many uh, you know, billions of computer cycles, we can arrive at the best combination of neural network architecture and uh, best inputs and parameters. And the, the genetic algorithm might even say, you know, that, that, that input you have, that's not even a good input. That's just throwing things off. We do better if we exclude that. So that might even be uh, the result. So if we do all that, what happens? Up top, here we have the results I've already shown you, the unoptimized results for the uh, moving trend system, we'll call it. Down here, if we apply um, uh, five walk forwards to our uh, out of sample testing, and we optimize using neural networks and genetic algorithms, we have a, a fairly significant increase in the annualized return, a small increase in the drawdown. Um, uh, incidentally, to me, the most important characteristics, characteristics of a system are the annualized return and the drawdown. The annualized return tells you whether the system is worth trading or not. If the annualized return is less than buy and hold, not worth the effort. But the drawdown tells you if the system is tradable. If you have two systems, one with a 20% annualized return and a 50% drawdown, and another with an 18% annualized return and a 10% drawdown, to me, the system with a lower drawdown is better because you might actually stick with that system. Very few people are gonna stick with a mechanical system that has a, a very large drawdown. Uh, I've seen systems with as high as 90% drawdowns. Uh, you've gotta have nerves of steel to stick with a system like that. And you have no way of knowing at that point, whether it's heading to zero or whether it's actually going to show a good return. So this, this is a, a brief example, a very simple system. And by using some, uh, by applying neural networks and genetic algorithms, we're, uh, we're able to uh, substantially uh, improve our return. Um, so this talk has gone a little uh, more quickly than I uh, thought it would. So we're nearing the end. Um, these are the, oh, absolutely, question. On the previous slide. Mm -hmm. Could you clarify that fine point on whether a lower drawdown number between the two now, optimized versus non-optimized is an improvement or whether the improvement is in the difference between the return and the drawdown for the two systems. Um, the second one I would has say, a greater difference. The first one has not as much difference, but it's got a lower drawdown. Right. Um, it's frequently a trade-off. And I would say here that the trade-off was certainly worth it. Um, if the second results, do you see my cursor when I move it around? Okay. Um, if say we had double the return, but four times the drawdown, I was like, eh, I don't know. That, I'm not sure I'd want to trade that system. But these are these are pretty close, and I wouldn't be concerned at all about that. Uh, realize that going back to a much earlier slide, I showed that the, the buy and hold market has 50% drawdowns. So uh, I think you're doing pretty well here. And I wouldn't be concerned at that difference, particularly at, at these levels. Does that answer your question? Okay, um, so, so going back to the objectives and summing up, um, uh, I think the, the Siegel graph 
clearly show that stocks are the place to be, um, that you, you can clearly time the market. I showed both the 4% swing system and the Delta record. Um, uh, number three is, I guess, a little harder to prove because some people do extremely well with fundamental analysis. Uh, Peter Lynch was probably the greatest stock picker ever uh, with the Magellan Fund, um, was a fundamental analyst and did extremely well. Um, I think Buffett shows that as you get into the uh, um, you know, tens of billions of dollars, it becomes more difficult because uh, it's difficult to acquire large positions in a company, but um, I'm convinced of number three. I'll acknowledge that um, uh, it may be difficult to convince everyone. I know some years back I was giving a talk at TCF and um, the next speaker came in and started to set up and just launched into a um, uh, uh, a soliloquy about uh, why fundamental analysis was better. And um, what, what can I say? They, they, they both have their beliefs, but for me, technical analysis is the way to go. And then I can show over and over that, that a good system can be made a little better or a lot better using some uh, uh, biologically derived mathematical techniques such as neural networks. Neural networks are based on the architecture of the brain and genetic algorithms are based on uh, the process of evolution. Um, so uh, if you're interested in the, uh, in the Delta system, uh, the, the website nquant.com has subscription information. If you email me either at Don, D-O-N-N, at nquant.com, or any address that's on the nquant site, um, uh, I, I would offer a $100 uh, a year discount on the subscription rate. Um, and um, all I can say is, is exercise caution. I mean, this is a lightly regulated market, um, and there are many, many people who, who do not beat, buy, and hold and yet sell systems for you know, 500, 1,000 or several thousand dollars or, or even more. I, I, I've seen um, uh, all kinds of things. So be, be very careful what you're buying. If you're starting off with a new system, paper trade it. Almost uh, every brokerage offers, uh, uh, offers paper trading where you're you know, just trading theoretical money. Um, be, be extremely careful. Um, well, the fat lady has sung and we're at the end. Uh, be happy to take any questions. Um, I have to say it's a, it's a, little, um, a little more difficult um, uh, uh, giving this via Zoom because uh, it's hard to judge the, uh, rea the reaction of the audience. But uh, anyway, I, I thank everyone for attending. We've got a fair amount of time left, so I'd be happy to take any uh, questions or discussion. Yeah, Don, this is Joe. Hey, Joe. Um, I've known Don for a long time, and uh, I got to tell you, his system's great. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I've had, um, the only problem I've had is convincing various uh chase money manager i have to uh to uh to work on these uh signals and um so which forced me to set up my own accounts uh, over 10 years ago so uh, all i can say is um you know be skeptical do everything on uh, paper first as don said and but i'm telling you this 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 uh this system does does work and it's as Don said, it doesn't work if you try any kind of individual stock monitoring and trending. But when you look at uh, QQQQ, if you look at Qs, then you can look at an index fund, and it does. It is it is uh, subject to analysis. Anyhow, yeah, that's my two cents. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, Joe. Yes. Thank you. I just wanted to ask you to clarify the 4% system in quotes that you referenced. 
right? Yes. I didn't quite follow whether that was oh. just a an algorithmic form of rebalancing whenever things get 4% out of balance. Um, no, it, it, it doesn't involve rebalancing. It's it, This would be traded on, I think it was originally described on the value line index, which is an arithmetic weighted index of all listed stocks in the US, but it works for um, S&P 500, the NASDAQ 100. And it simply, it simply says that um, when the market goes up 4%, you buy into the market. And when it goes down 4%, you either go to cash or you short the market. And that's it. I mean, it's, it's, it's utter simplicity. You, you don't even need a computer to trade it. You can do it with a graph paper and a, uh, and a finely demarcated ruler. Um, and, and in fact, back in the 70s, uh, a lot of people didn't have trading computers or access to data or anything like that. So maybe it was actually originally done, but it's simply a, a, it's simply a long cash or long short system. It does not involve any kind of uh, rebalancing. And, um, um, and it, I mean, it logically makes sense that you're, 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 when the market goes, starts to go up, you climb on board and when the market starts to go down, you, you get out. And it's clearly not perfect because you're always gonna miss the first 4% of every move. But the, the, the main reason for mentioning it was, was simply as a counterexample to say that you can't time the market. And you can time the market. I mean, if, if a simple system like that works, and if I, I mentioned Art Collins, uh, again, artcollins.com, um, and he's even, he's even, uh, he's written several books and he has started publishing a series of almanacs where he looks back 10 or 20 years to systems he describes. And he says, how have the systems done in the past 10 years? Um, and they've, they've done pretty well. I mean, that's, that's a pretty courageous thing to do. You will find very, very few people who have done a look back and looked at their results. Um, so, uh, I like him. He's also he's he's very very plain spoken, and he um, he says his piece and and goes home. His he doesn't have long drawn out um, uh, things. Anyway, um, I've mentioned in the past. I'll just mention this briefly. Uh, I, I've listened to a lot of financial seminars, webinars, lectures, whatever, and I have. Um, I call it the 10 minute rule. And if the person hasn't said something useful in the first 10 minutes, I turn it off. And um, a, a lot of people, I mean, 10 minutes and they're still, they're still, uh, you know, showing you their, um, you know, their yacht and their private jet and their home. And they're talking about, uh, you know, how they've uh, risen from the ashes in the past 10 years. And, and sometimes this goes on for 15 and 20 minutes. And, uh, um, when I have stayed around and listened to those talks, they never have anything useful to say. They're sales pitches. They're, they're trying to sell you, you know, their system for $97 a month or $995 a year or, or whatever. And there's no useful information there. So I hope I said something useful in the first 10 minutes. Anyway. Hello there. This is yes. Grace. This is Grace in Sarasota, Florida. And oh, um, hi. And so I had my money in Vanguard. And when the pandemic happened, I ran, I put everything in a money market. Mm -hmm. And it's still in a money market. And oh. so um, I'm getting ready to sell my house, which is going to give me even more money to be sitting on. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking for a way to, of course, make money. I've been in Vanguard. S&P 500 and also in junk bonds prior to the pandemic and have done very, very well. So I'm interested. Nice. Yeah, I'm interested in any way to, to get my money to start making money. Hmm. Well, um, um, you know, I'm not a, a financial advisor. I'm probably not supposed to give individual financial advice, but that being said, um, 
I would look at them. I would look at the market again, and I would look at um, at um, broad market funds, exchange traded funds, and this conceivably could be uh, a risky time. Um, now, the people ask, with for example, with the the, the system I publish, um, well, I didn't take the I didn't take your entry signal back in you know March or April of 2020. What do I do now? And the, the system really is is uh, undefined, um, you know, midway through. Um, I mean, the technical indicators are saying that the market still has a ways to go. Um, and with the government, you know, just dumping money as fast as it can into the economy, it's hard to believe that the market would turn around. On the other hand, interest rates are going up and inflation is the big bugaboo for the stock market. Um, what, what some people recommend is a technique called dollar cost averaging. Um, if you have $100 to invest, you don't invest $100 on day one, you invest $10. You wait a month, you invest another $10. And the thought is that if, um, uh, if prices go down, um, you're, you're averaging your entry over time. And I, that's fairly standard advice, I would think, for financial advisors. You know, don't, don't put 100% of your money in on day one. Um, dollar cost average in. And um, uh, it's congratulations that you, you've, uh, you've done well in the market. And I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't abandon it. Um, the, um, uh, not, to, uh, not to plug the system that, that I published, but, but um, it, it did not get back in at the bottom, at the absolute bottom, but um, um, it, did, it did recommend getting back in when the market had, um, had started to recover. And um, people who subscribe to the system have written to me and said, gee, what's the use of your system? You've been on a buy signal for a year. Uh, I go, well, so is the market. And I mean, if you look at, at market returns, it's done well. But um, I suppose um, the short answer is look at dollar cost averaging and you may wanna, you may wanna work with a, a financial advisor. Thank you. And how do I get your, your system? How do I? Oh, you can subscribe to it just by going to NQANT, N-Q-U-A-N-T. It's, it's on the bottom of every slide. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm on there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and there should be a subscribe uh, page. If if there okay. isn't, uh, if there isn't, <laughs> um, I'll have to uh, take it up with our webmaster, who is my son. <laughs> and um, but 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 there should be, and and you can um, uh, there are there's contact information also at nquant.com. So if you have questions or you're unable to subscribe, let me let me know, and we'll. Uh, we'll uh, we'll take care of it. He he attended. My son attended TCF last year, but he had a uh, prolonged gaming session last night, and um, we're, we're on a mountain time. We're a couple hours earlier, so he didn't make the talk today. Mr. Fishman, that's all the time. I think we're I think we're over. Oh, I'm I'm so sorry. Yeah, Greg. no, that's uh, I'm just saying that's the last question. So okay. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you all for attending. It's been a different experience, and um, I appreciate your your listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see the subscribe uh, button. Okay, and um, uh, if you send me an email, I'll I'll send you a link where you can uh, save a hundred bucks. Yes, I wrote that down. <laughs> thank you very okay. much. All righty. Thank, thank you. you so much. Bye now. Hmm.